What is good? We're on to round three of our rookie wide receiver profiles. We've covered Jalen Waddle, Rashad Bateman. And if you've missed any of those guys, don't let that happen again. Hit that subscribe button. Get the notification. We got ADP reviews going down every month. Uh, all sorts of, of good stuff. Free agency is about to hit. We'll be mocking it up before you know it. Uh, so do your boys a favor. Hit that subscribe. Get all that stuff right to your little fingertips and uh, help your boys out if you're enjoying the show. Today, we're going to go with Rondell Moore. Super interesting guy here. A lot to get into. Uh, 5'9", 180. Bing! Uh, <laughs> 20 years old. He'll be 21 in June. So feeling good about the age there. That's a good check. You know, height and weight. Little low. Age. Strong. He's from Trinity High School in Louisville, Kentucky. A four-star recruit, according to 24-7. Or 247. 247 sports. <laughs> Uh, He was the number one prospect out of Kentucky. Uh, He was widely recruited, had offers from Alabama, Ohio State, Michigan State, Penn State, Georgia, among others. And he originally committed to Texas, but then he decommitted and went to the Purdue Boilermakers. Make it four Boilermakers. (laughs) You were supposed to say Boilermakers. We're going to play the clip. Hey, what are you going to do? I mean, apparently the guy loves Boilermakers. I don't know. Dude, I had no idea that the Purdue mascot was a shot of whiskey inside of a beer. Yeah, who did know? I think I think it's more of an homage to how good they are at engineering. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> you know who looks like they drink Boilermakers is the Wake Forest mascot. He oh, looks like he's been crushing. He's, he's fucking Boil- tuned up. He's definitely drinking Boilermakers. I want my gets- Boilermaker a la carte. You know, I want the <laughs> whiskey shot separate. Separate ingredients. Who wants to mix that in? I've had some some wild nights on the on the Boilermakers. Every once in a while, we would go with the loaded Coronas, a little Bacardi Lemon in the uh, Coronas. A little when the, you're at the, the beach, Bacardi a seems more... a lot better than the whiskey in a beer. I... Yeah, it's just, it's man things, Jason. You wouldn't oh, understand. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's move on. But you know who wouldn't have done what Rodell Moore did? Decommit. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> no, he Rashad, it. he's staying there. Rashad Bateman said, hey, I'm sticking to my guns. Uh, hey, but not to necessarily not round them more for decommitting. He, he One of the reasons he cited uh, why he wanted to go to Purdue is so that uh, all of his family could come to like every game. And he's a big he's a big family guy. And he wanted those people close to him. And so they were able to attend, you know. Yeah, so Most maybe he's games. maybe he's not a big of Boilermaker fan as we had originally thought it. He just likes his family. Mm-hmm. What an odd concept. Anyway, I don't want to attack this guy's character because the character right. is absolutely elite. This guy just he absolutely fucking works. He combines freakish athleticism with a maniacal work ethic and an intense focus that borders on robotic. Uh, and that was like the first article that I read on him from a, that was an NFL.com article. Good article. Um, and that right there would just started really putting everything together. I knew who he was. I knew saw the play on the field. And then that was just like, hmm. top that off squat, 600 pounds. Incredible. That Lowe's legs are. And, and that was just a true freshman. That was as a true freshman. You heard that call on the, on the, the live broadcast from Kirk Herb street. I was like, did he just say he squats 600 pounds? It's like, and what does that tell you about that kid right off the rip that he already has a, a, a dedication, a commitment routine, like, Work and ethic. genetics. That's just ge- there's, some, genet- right. there's some genetics just, in there. Right. Like no matter how hard I work, I'm probably not going to get to squat in 600 pounds. You know what I mean? Like he has yeah. the ability, but you have to you have to get there. You have to unlock that ability. You know, you could probably take a couple cycles of steroids and work really hard. Might be able to get there. Maybe well, maybe not quite 600, but going back 200 push ups a day in middle school. That's just to go back to what you were saying, Jay Wayne. That that's where this guy just is. He just is focused, laser focused. Character is crazy. He works hard. He wants to be the best. 500 bugs balls off the jug machine a day. Uh, 20 minutes early to just every workout ready to crush. Uh, then on to some quotes here are some people who were around him, and some one is kind of a, a self quote here. Uh, He's an elite athlete who always shows up 20 minutes early with his shoes tied, ready to work. He could lift with our linemen and outrun our skill guys. He's just a special, special player. People ask him about the height question and his response is, you have the film. You can see what I can do. If that scares you too much, then cool, man. Just just pass. That's fine. Like 
He's like, hey, and then he talks more about how it's not necessarily a chip on his shoulder. He absolutely loves what he does. He's having a blast doing it. So, hey, I'm putting good shit out there. If you don't like it, see ya. I'm out. And then uh, in a Purdue wide receiver coach asked him, how big are you really? And Rondell's response was, how big is fast? I'm, like, I'm fast. That's how big I am. Right. How big yeah, is put- that? Put the tape on. Look at that. Look, look at me go. I, I like all of those things. I like the swag. I like the attitude. Uh, I like the work ethic. I like the character. And I like the fact that there is some fantastic genes going on here. Not and not we're not talking about Levi's like these are good genes. Hey, this is the wrong with Levi jeans. <laughs> no, there isn't. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying <laughs> no, these are good jeans. These are true. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't mean it. I was I meant, you know, they doji, but they ain't 300. <laughs> <laughs> Those bugle boy jeans you wearing? Hell no, ho. You know they polo. Nobody want no polo shit to me, bitch. <laughs> so getting into the the uh, metrics here, college dominator in the 36.7, 72nd percentile. Not bad. Uh, pretty good. 40, 40s elite is mm. what you're looking for. So it's, it's pretty high up there. So he's not uh, good. The, and the breakout age. Oh. Whoa, the breakout age. 18.2. Or he broke out at age 18.2, so 18 and two months. Kids haven't graduated high school, and he's already breaking out. Right. He's in the like 90, breakout age, 90, can't even buy cigarettes. He's in the 99th percentile. Excuse me. He can barely buy His breakout age can barely buy cigarettes. No, you, no, you, you can buy cigarettes at it's 21 now, I believe. Oh, they moved it to 21? Yeah. I mean, I don't Good have those things to worry about anymore, but. Good yeah. for them. Good for you, government. Way to move yeah. it up. Bad for the young generation of pot smokers out there who can't have bongs in their house. He's trying to get it. Boy, let me get one of them Phillies. I can't even buy a Philly until like, I'm 21. You can't eat like you're you definitely don't look 21. 18 at, at certain stores, they might just pass you right along. 21's a little mm-hmm. hard. Like you go up there with a Dutch and a case of beer, and you're like, hmm. Yeah, a little dicey. Anyway, not that I'm <laughs> A proponent of those things stay in school obviously there's going to be no combine this year but you can see the metrics were good and you know it, it, it's going to hurt this guy a little bit but he's got a history of testing well athletically uh, dating back to high school he was laser timed at a chicago open nike deal at, at 433 a freaking laser beam this guy's oh, out running lasers. laser beams <laughs> yeah you might as well just have sharks with lasers on their heads this guy's just absolutely crushing it. Um, and then Bummer so, for him, no, pro, no, no combine for sure. Sure. So I, he would have absolutely killed the combine. He's going to have a strong pro day. And we know, you know, the pro day is going to be a little exaggerated and you're going to have to, you know, take a little bit off from that. But Rondell is going to absolutely smoke it. And then the in character, the, the in-person stuff for, for the, combine he would have absolutely knocked that out of the park too he's gonna have strong interviews however he does it but i feel like that in person he would have absolutely crushed it so definitely gonna hurt him a little bit with the no combine but you know this he is a joy to watch on an interview that is for sure like i said with the character that he has he's just gonna and and all these pro day things these are things that are gonna move him up the board when they come out and everybody gets hip to how great this dude is and how fast he is. I know some of the scouts already know it, but teams will be, Hey, now we can talk to you, see what's up. Uh, that's really, I think going to help R- the Rondell Moore's case here. So anyhow, let's get into the counting stats. It gets a little weird in the, in the end to middle here because Rondell Moore really only played in 2018. The only year where you can really gauge uh, what this guy is all about. So it's in 2000, freshman year. right in 2018, he was the fourth most targeted player in the country, 154 targets, the second most receptions in the country with 114 number one in AVT, which is avoided tackles after receptions with 37. Uh, so that's, th- those are crazy numbers. there. 11 yards per reception, 12 TDs, 892. Yeah. Yak. Yak. 7.8 yak per reception. Let's go and ahead then, and nominate this guy for uh, yak of the year. Yeah, uh, I like it. I think we should. W- w- we've been talking about all these rookie prospects. We've got some more to do. I think we should. He's definitely a, a nomination. He's probably leading the, the pack right now for yak of the year. That's yak with a K. Uh, but we'll crown that that victor uh, later on this offseason. Yak of the yak. Don't talk back. <laughs> Uh, so he obviously the way he's built and stuff like that, uh, he's got to project as a slot guy. And, and the 2018 
kind of tells you what it is. 91.6% in the slot does have seven drops in the, you know, obviously 104 targets is a lot. So seven drops throughout that isn't crazy, but we'll kind of talk about that a little more as we, as we go on. One more thing on the 2018, he was only the third player in high school or in, in history of college football to earn consensus all American honors as a true freshman. The other two being Herschel Walker and Adrian Peterson. So strong company there. Um, that, that's that's pretty crazy. So now we get into a little bit of the injury history. We had a knee and a hamstring that caused him to miss four games, all but four games in 2019. Um, and then 2020, a little bit of the same story. Yeah, not sure what that knee injury was. They don't really clarify very much. Um, it's a hamstring. It's a knee. It's undisclosed. It's, it's definitely a hammy. The weird thing is, though, is that is that that hammy lingered from 19 to 20. So he he uh, he came out and apologized to his team like after uh, coming back in 2020, his first game, which was like, I think, four games into the season. Um, he came and apologized. I'm like, why is this man apologizing? First off, he, he like crushed that game. He came back, but he was apologizing because he had he said he re-aggravated a hamstring injury in camp. So that's a little alarming. Like, how'd you re-aggravate it if you all you had the all off season? Pretty far right. removed. Yeah. Right. So then so to, to make matters more weird, he went into the coach's office and asked the coach to list him with an undisclosed injury instead of saying it was a hammy because he thought he could beat the timetable to get back on the field. And so then he was apologizing for his te- to his teammates and the, and the team and everything for being a distraction because people were like, what's this undisclosed injury? And he was trying to say it was like his reasoning to do it to begin with. And it's just like, I don't know why you do that. It all seems a little fishy. Why was it re-aggravated? What's up with this hamstring? But at least knowing that it was primarily a hamstring injury, both 19 and 20, at least like gives you some context because he's so twitchy. These right. players have a hard time. Their hamstrings have a hard time holding on. This is a typical type of injury for a that guy man, with twitchy. You saw the breakout age. He's just breaking out of everything. He just breaks out. His hamstring broke out too early. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> but it is a little weird that there, there isn't, uh, when you look around for the injury history, it's very f- f- murky, foggy. It's, tough, it's yeah. unclear to really figure out what was going on. Uh, but he does come in, and in, in 2019, he plays four games, 38 targets, 29 receptions, 13.3 yards per reception. So that's his career best there. Only two touchdowns, 210 uh, yak yards, 7.2 yak per reception, 75% in the slot with three so, drops. So three drops in four games. Don't love Did that. Did start to move outside a little bit more. Also, yeah. he plays in the backfield a, a decent amount, too. Some of that percentage of snaps. Yeah. So, But he has two crazy games in 2019, 11 receptions for 124 yards and a touchdown. Um, and then he plays against Nevada. And then he plays against Vanderbilt, 13 for 220, averaging 16.9 and a, and a, a, a catch. And then another touchdown to go with that. Um, and then he has two other not so great games against TCU and Minnesota. And then we moved to 2020 and he has misses opts out with COVID comes back. We talked about the injury kind of lingering and uh, has a crazy game. It all leads up to this crazy game against Minnesota, 115 or 15 catches for 116 yards. Um, and then he kind of has a down game seven for 76, which, you know, some people that's a great game. Um, and then, comes back with Nebraska 13 for 78. So, you know, not great a dot there, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in general. Uh, so, you know, has a pretty good, has big games in those campaigns in 19 and 20, but doesn't really put it all together. And we don't see a full season weird injury stuff. Uh, so, you know, that's what's keeping him down right now. I, I think it's, it's definitely not hurting them a little bit. You know, there's some injury proneness and, and size and stuff like that that might be hurting them. Let's, let's mix move. that with the buzz he's missing out on by not having a ridiculous combine. Right, right. That, that would be, you know, the pro day is going to be good, but I don't think it's going to create the same buzz that that, nah. you know, that big combine would have. So let's, right. let's move on to the kind of film stuff. These things we saw Wasps watching more. Um, he's... A big thing for he's just got these huge, powerful legs that create fantastic leg drive. Pair that with the grit, the heart, the determination, and he's a, just a very, very tough out on the field. A little bit of the violent mover, which is a good thing and a little bit of a bad thing, could possibly be leading to some of these soft tissue issues. Uh, but he will stick that foot in the ground, and then that next move is so fast and aggressive, man. Like, so 
but I, I do feel like he does move a little violently out there. Not to say that there isn't some smoothness to his game, but when he cuts and plants, like it's so aggressive. And some of it is because he is, you know, a lot of players don't have that combination of being quick and really fast like that and so explosive. Yeah, I think he's also being so quick and fast, like some guys can just really lean on that. He does a good job of varying his play speed when he needs to. Uh, and he has this little stutter step that a lot of the times when he's making a move, he'll kind of stutter a little bit and then goes, leans back on that explosiveness to just gets the guy to slow down enough. And his start stop is way better than everybody else's start stop on the field. So it gets him, you know, a lot of the times. And this, he just, to go along with that, he plays like an RB on the field with the ball in his hands. Oh, uh, he's the yak is so ridiculous. Right. He's obviously not built like Debo Samuel, but like, that's like a player that with the ball in his hands, he kind of can move around like there's some tackles that you just don't even know how he got out of. There's the there's power, but also the slipperiness. And it's just it's just so much fun to watch. Like he's so explosive and he's similar to Waddle in the terms that he can return punts and kicks. And they're both like small of stature, but they're insane in the membrane out there just going hard in the paint as a small insane dude re returning punts and kicks like that's how they treat the middle of the field too when they're playing in the slot like they just yeah. no fear going over the middle of the field no fear taking on contact running through it getting extra yards after the catch you know like you said he can be using the three phases of the game wide receiver running back returner and the returner can really help put his skills on display uh, the elite things that he can do in the open field where I think he's going to be a high enough pick where you don't necessarily he's not going to be vying for spots on the field but it could help him possibly gain some value by, you know, that those highlight plays. Right. David Johnson made a name for himself as a rookie returning punts and kicks and, and scoring a touchdown almost every game in some form or fashion. And it was like, man, this guy's bursting the seams. If he could just get some more work, it'd be yeah. awesome. And, and, but you can, players can, can elevate their value and remind people of how good of a playmaker they are when you right. do those things. And, and it can only help raise his value. A hundred percent. So, yeah. So let's move on to a little bit of some cons. Obviously, we talked about the injuries, um, but according uh, uh, an article that I found that I thought was interesting and, and a little damning to the case, you know, but we're going to we're going to talk our way through it. Uh, according to Pro Football Focus, 77 percent of Moore's targets were less than nine yards down the field. So we talked a little bit about a dot five point four. Not great. Not good. Um, in 2018, 35% of his targets came from either a screen pass, sweep, or flare. Limited kind of things. A lot of stuff behind, at, or just in front of the line of scrimmage. There's a, I think now, in 2018, like 104 of his touches came behind or, you know, within 10 yards in the middle of the field at the line of scrimmage. So that's a little crazy. So people um, want to knock him for that? Like, they want to, like, but to me, it's like they've got this true freshman who is a threat to house it at, from anywhere on the field every time he touches it. And so they they want to throw a bunch at him. Like, they want to get a bunch of balls in his hands. They want to put, put it in his hands. Because they, like... Because it could turn into six points like that. So, like, you've got this true freshman, and they did an interview with him and, and talked about the journey and how he got there, and they were like, you know, he was like, as a true freshman, they just kept throwing more and more at me, and and the coach was calling you know, making me run plays we might not even call. And, and, and I was being able to pick it up and they just started. It's like, it's like, how are we going to knock this guy for being so damn good as a true freshman that they wanted to manufacture him short touches? And then we're going to knock him for right. lack of air yards or the lack of depth of target. And I just, I just don't understand it because if you're getting, if you look at these game logs, and if your floor is five for 50 or, or seven for 73, your floor is Cole Beasley, but your ceiling <clears throat> is making my play in one and, and making sure. my day in one play. Like the ceiling is the sky and, and the floor is awesome. Like, I just, I just don't know why we're knocking this guy for this a dot. Yeah. Well, I'll come back to the a dot in a second and that, but I did want to add in, we talked about the drops for a second. It is concerning over 17 games, 13 drop passes. And we talked about the 2018 with the seven drop passes. Um, but the character of this guy is, is, you know, going to make him be, that's, that's a something that you can get better at. And we're talking about a lot of short, quick things where this guy's calculating moves down the field and maybe getting a little too far ahead of himself. I think these are things that are very, uh, clean upable, if that's a word. Sure. Um, so and, and yeah, like and, I said, the work, the work and the 
the amount that this guy cares, I think that's, you know, some guys wouldn't give a shit, but it seems right. like, you know, Rondell Moore could clean that up a little bit. And he's putting in the work on the jugs machine. And, and, and he also doesn't let those tro- drops get him down. Like he had a big drop against Ohio state in the red zone. And then he comes back two plays later and scores a touchdown. And, it, and I'm like, they routed OSU there in 2018, yeah. kind of put him on the map, but it was like, it was really nice to see him bounce back from that drop. Cause you see him like banging his helmet and mad right. at himself. Cause he made a terrible, you know, concentration drop. And then the next two plays or whatever, they throw him like a quick out and he's able to accelerate around the short edge and get into the end zone. And it was like the Ohio state didn't know what to do with that man. Mm-hmm. They, they were throwing everybody at him. They were trying to press him. He was getting off of the jam. He was running. He was getting off the contact, getting open. They were holding him. He was creating separation. They threw other players at him. Nobody could stop that man. No, he was at, he was on one that day. Um, and I, you know, I didn't want to bring it back down a little bit because I was liking what you were saying about, you know, not not hating on the A dot thing, but I felt like we needed to talk about that real quick before we got too far away from it. Um, but sure. yeah, I, I liked what you were saying, man. Like, and maybe some of it even goes back to, hey, we're getting the ball in the in this guy's hands quickly in the middle of the field because this is what he can do well, and this is what we see him doing well. But it's not to say that he can't be used down the field and Purdue just number one. The quarterback play was garbage most of the time. Um, and yeah, and you the know, offense didn't do him any favors. It you know, didn't do him just... a ton of favors. Like you, yeah, I know there's another receiver there who was getting some balls downfield, but like there's, you can't, you can't tell me that, uh, Rondell Moore can't be used downfield a little bit here and there. Now, I personally do think that his skill set leans. I want to see him in motion, moved around and working in that middle of the field because I like the ball in his hands, like a running back and, and manufacture touches. But it's not to say that he can't shake people, get open intermediately and get open deep here and there to, to keep people honest. Like and and furthermore, you know, these are very non risky plays to get the ball in his hands and he can do the rest. He's so fucking good that he could take any play and turn it into a big one and break the game with it because he does have so many different elite traits. Um, like I mentioned before, like there isn't a whole lot of guys who are as twitchy as he is and have the top end speed and the acceleration. Like this is this, right? He, got- he truly does have a whole great bag of stuff. That's great. And I'm not going to sit here and worry too, too much about the a dot being something that I worry about getting them down. Now, like, being, let me real quick. Ahead, let me just say this. We're evaluating him on his true freshman season. Right. And he's got us so excited from a true freshman season. I can't think of a prospect in the past where we were only able. Now we've only been at this hardcore for maybe five years now, but I can't recall a prospect where we're basically evaluating him on a true freshman season. And that's it. Yeah, you didn't get to see everything else. Now you can you can consider that a little bit of a knock that, you know, we couldn't see the rest of that because he wasn't available. You know, sometimes your best trait is availability. Sure. Um, I get yeah. that. I get that. But 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 to just to 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 knock him for air yards because we're evaluating him on a true freshman season where he was so special so quickly and so young that they just had to get the ball in his hands as short and as fast as they could do it. I don't want to knock him for that. So, yeah, I agree. As elite as this guy is and as fun as he is and as much as we really do like him and as much as we just defended a little bit of the dot and some of the bad things that people are going to say about him, I do think he is elite, but maybe somewhat dependent. Um, you know, we just talked about Bateman, who's the opposite, where doesn't seem very dependent. You can draft it and feel pretty good about it. He can slide right in to be in that, that natural receiver position uh, where he could do a lot with a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, are any of Bateman's traits necessarily elite? Like he's bad, maybe, maybe not quite on the level where Rashad Bateman is, but you know, Bateman, Bateman makes you feel, feel pretty good. And, and you can, you can, poke hole a lot more holes in Rondell Moore's game here. And he could be a little bit more dependent on the system that he ends up in. And and there may have to be some patience for what you're going to get out of Rondell Moore. And there it is, you know, sure. He could go to a shitty team and the quarterback and him be on the same page and the offense be designed with him in mind and, and, and get some, you know, a lot of, seven for seventies, which, you know, Hey, I'm not going to be upset about that. If that's your floor, if your floor is five for 50, I'm not upset about that. Knowing that he could break one at any point, do some end around stuff, do some running back shit and, and pop a long ball off. But if he gets in the right system, 
and right. gets to the right off of coordinator the green bay and you're losing aaron jones uh they've been looking for another weapon they have some bigger fast guys but they don't have guys that can do that dirty work. aaron jones did a lot of that aaron Rodgers loved him it seems like you know aaron they're gonna let aaron or, uh, aaron jones take taste some free agency Devonte adams is king dingling around there he's gonna eat up a lot of a lot of brain capacity for anybody who's coming in to try to stop the Packers. And they all, they all knew it this year and still couldn't stop him Add a guy like Rondell Moore to an organization like that with a quarterback like that, with a, a coordinator and off and Matt LaFleur like that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm pretty interested. You know, the, the jets have LaFleur's brother over there. Now the jets are the jets, but you know, that's a guy who could get him involved. Uh, we, there, there's a, some, some cord would make this, transition make you feel a lot better about it where they could put him in the position to put him in the best position to do what he does well um, and really utilize him to his fullest potential whereas it may be hard to find him to be a week in week out viable fantasy option if he goes to the wrong situation right away anyway I don't disagree with you necessarily uh, I think that uh, because he is so versatile and because he does so many different things that there are a lot of different ways that a coordinator can use him. And yes, it, that how they want to use him is going to dictate how consistent he is for you on a week to week basis basis for fantasy production. Right. I love this player. I feel like he has elite traits. He has the character and the work ethic to not fail. And he's going to be good for an NFL team. And he's going to he's going to help them win games. I don't know if it's going to immediately translate to fantasy production. You might have to wait. You might have to have some patience, that magic P word that nobody dirty, ever wants to the have dirty word in the dynasty realm, dirty word. If you didn't, if you're not the fucking best ever after half of a yeah. year, you're a bust. Clyde I, Edwards was the God and Jonathan Taylor was, uh, he's Trent, he's Trent Richardson. You better sell him. Cause right. uh, oh, oh now, this guy who's, who was the, and then that's a guy who was one of the highly touted, most highly touted prospects in a, in a few years outside of Saquon Barkley. And, uh, if Nick Chubb wouldn't have got injured, those kind of guys, and he's right up there with them and, and people are ready to, throw him to the fucking wolves by, you know, in a couple of weeks, cause he's not out there producing. So just think about what old little Rondell Moore is going to have to go through. If he's not going out there and doing his thing right away and putting out highlight reel after highlight reel. Right. I know. And that's, and, and so maybe, you know, if you miss on Rondell Moore, maybe there'll be an opportunity now to, to, to buy him a little bit later, but he also could come out and start just murking. You know, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised at either of those scenarios playing out, but the way I'm going to play it is I, I'm I'm excited to draft this guy towards like the end of the first round, and we'll get into the to where he's he being drafted in a, in a minute. But like when when Nick Chubb and and Sony Michelle, there was the debate between those guys, and when, as soon as Sony got drafted by the good team and the good landing spot with the draft capital, it was he was the surefire choice over Nick Chubb because Chubb was at the terrible landing spot of the Browns, and like look how that played out. Right, there's there's tons more examples like that to the point where I'm trying never to be like, well, he's very landing spot dependent. It's like, no. Right. Do you like the player? Do you like the talent? Do you like him on and off the field? Do you and like where you gonna, he's where, where you have to take him? Do you feel comfortable about the right. spot where you, you can take him? It's do you like how expensive his thing. value is? Right. right. Are you cool pulling the trigger with where you need to get him? And, and if you are, then, then, then this is why we play dynasty, grab him and stash him and wait for that thing to blossom because it's going to, I just don't know if it's going to be immediate. So just relax and have some patience. But yeah. man, I feel, I mean, I feel excited see, about taking this guy. You know, you talked about the Patriots and the Browns things kind of switching around a little bit and how fast that landing. And then now, now you're seeing just, you know, a little bit of the NBA style of things trickling into how the NFL is working, where guys are trying to force their way out of certain situations and things are changing like they've never changed before. And, you know, I don't know if that'll stay or not. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily going anywhere. We'll see how the Deshaun Watson and the Russell Wilson thing play out, but that never fucking happened before. You didn't have a franchise quarterback. And until they were, you know, basically you felt like you had gotten everything out of him and you needed to, to change over the guard organizationally because you've had the same guy for so long, you know, those guys stayed put and, you know, so it's just an interesting, uh, the whole landing spot thing can, can get a little overblown, but I, I do think he is elite, but dependent, uh, somewhat, uh, and you're going to have to have some patience. So there's a, a gadget kind of player, which I think is a dirty word. A lot of the times, who's his cop, it, who's his cop, what's right. his cop cop. And I don't, I, 
he is a, a can be considered into that gadget role, but I think the good gadget players who can do so much are are getting us closer and closer to that positionless football thing where I think we're trying to head. And you know, you have your Curtis Samuels and uh, Paris Campbell's who you haven't seen a whole lot of, and uh, you know, Lavisca Chenault and Urban Meyer is about to go, you know. It, there and he's always had a guy like one of these guys. He's had a you know he's had Curtis Samuels and Percy Harvins. And, he had two you know, or three of those guys. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know those kind of players. And Percy was probably a little before his time, and you know had migraines and some crazy shit go down. But he Curtis was an Samuel, elite fantasy producer, though. Curtis Samuel, you've seen bits and pieces of him be. And then this year, he got in the right situation with the right play callers, and then the right him who yeah it was Robbie Anderson for a little while saying hey Robbie Anderson's really good and yeah they had three receivers go over a thousand yards but there was definitely a point in time in that Panthers offense with 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 Samuel where he was the fucking dude like you were holding your breath they were doing so many great things with him that he was having games week in week out it seemed like and he made himself some money here just availability is your best ability sometimes and the situation you went from a Ron Rivera coach team. That's kind of bland. We're going to do, you know, all the things that we're supposed to do in character and yada, yada, yada to a little bit of a new school approach with bright Joe Brady and, and Matt rule. And, and it, you know, you saw it really take hold and we haven't quite seen it with Paris Campbell, but you're excited with it with Frank Reich and Carson Wentz. You've seen little bits and pieces of Paris still buying into Paris. And we talked about Visca a little bit here, who, like I said, urban Myers, like the, the, the Trevor bubble here with, Visca is probably going to slam shut here in a little while when people really take hold in the, you know, this right. is a player that Urban He'll Myers had had, has Visca. had a lot of success with and has had a lot of them. And he kind of knows what to do with those guys and how to make them successful. And Visca's, you know, not built like any of those other fucking guys. He's at 220, but, you know, still hey, has that injury prone bug, though. Exactly. You know, which we're, is- hate, we're hating. We could be like, hey, part of the reason that this guy, you know, he's a little small and undersized, but he's injured. Well, Visca's, you know, six foot. 220, 220. And, and he stays, you know, banged up a little bit, or he has anyway. Debo Samuel, you know, kind of similar, th- thick up dude, similar build. And, you know, Keenan Allen was a guy who was an injury prone guy. We may never hear from Curtis Samuel of Paris or LaVisca in a year or two being injured really for a long period of time ever again. It could just be some bad fucking luck. Uh, but so I just wanted to kind of throw those guys out there. Gadget may not be the dirtiest with these those type of players especially uh, like you said where the nfl is moving right uh, and gainwell was a guy we talked about this kind of stuff with you know <laughs> yep. probably going to be a little more dependent uh, a little bit like rondell more maybe a little bit more versatility from the running back position better at playing the running back position anyway um let's just let's end this off with where he's going right now in adp as far as dlf is concerned this is who we did our 80 recent adp with we do a top 50 once a month when that comes out so dlf rookie adp have him at wide receiver nine uh ahead of J- or wide receiver four at pick nine ahead of jalen waddle and then you go to the dlf rankers and they have him uh eighth uh as the wide receiver five behind Jalen Waddle, who's the receiver for. So the public's telling you, hey, we like him a little more than the rankers are saying, hey, we we're taking Waddle over this guy. We're moving him down just a little bit further. And, you know, we'd rather have Waddle over that guy. So I'm. it's interesting that the public kind of feels one way and that the quote unquote experts feel, you know, a little bit different type of way. I think we're not far enough in to say any other guys that I would take over, but we have done Jalen on this show. I think I'm taking Jalen Waddle right now over Rashad Bateman. Um, but oh it's yeah, I'll, pretty similar. I gotta, I gotta grab Waddle. I'm really excited about Waddle. I'll take Waddle over Bateman. Um, I don't know if I would take Bateman over more. I, I like my head tells me that I should. My oh, heart says I that I want. Gotta, I think more. you gotta take Bateman over. Oh, so you're taking ba- you're taking Bateman over more. I think right now, right this second, I mean, obviously we haven't solidified anything. We're still going through this whole process. Some things might change a little bit. Some, you know, I don't think landing spots are going to dictate too much for me, but, you know, things could change and, you know, we could get through this process right now. If I'm taking Bateman over more and then I would probably, I'm taking Waddle over more. So probably bump him down to there. I, I feel like I'm aligned with the DLF uh, rankers right now. Bateman's, Pretty safe. I can't. I can't be too mad at you there. Um, I don't know what I'll do when I get on the clock. 
maybe just move back a little bit. But I, I think I think he's properly rated there towards the middle to end of the first round. I mean, yeah, the public's wrong. They're idiots. <laughs> well, I think they're probably, you know, the drafters that they got doing these drafts might be, you know, geared analytically. And then the analytics guys don't like Waddle as much. So fair. I could see that being why more with the 99th percentile breakout age, you know, that's yeah. being the, and, and, but they let that trump the A dot. So I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But I could tell you, you got to subscribe, like, and get the notification because we're going to be doing a bunch of rookie mocks and then we're going to get into regular startup mocks. So we'll we'll continue unfolding this whole process of, of who we think goes where and where the bet. Like I said, I think the value of where you have to take these guys and where you can get them is probably the most important process of all this and where you're comfortable and you feel good about that guy. Uh, so that's when those rookie drafts will really start to just iron all those things out for us. So, absolutely. Well, I think that wraps this up. We yeah. probably have gone too long per usual, but appreciate you guys sticking with us. Hit that notification button, and we'll be back. Leave us an iTunes review. If you yeah, if you're listening, listening to the iTunes, pod, hook your boys up. Don't forget about that. Appreciate, appreciate it, guys. It. Jinx. Peace.